printed prints that were uh, brought to us by Iskra Books. Um, Iskra Books um, presented this collection to us that we're hosting here at the uh, Fonseca Du Bois Gallery, which is powered by um, a member organization, Arts Mexicano, in Indiana. Um, so thank you for that. And um, we'll be discussing these prints, uh, as well as uh, a forthcoming book by Iskra Books um, that that showcase these prints, um, these prints and other prints, um, from what I understand, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that um, as we move forward. Um, we're honored to be joined by um, the folks from Iskra Books. Uh, there are three, three folks joining us, I'll introduce them shortly. Um, before we move to the panel, for those uh, that have not visited us before and are familiar with the Indian Liberation Center, let me please uh, introduce us and, and uh, what we do and, and what we're all about. So the Indianapolis Liberation Center is a physical and virtual community hub dedicated to advancing the causes of all oppressed and exploited people of Indianapolis and beyond by uniting and working to overcome the divisions of power imposed on us by the oppressing classes. By engaging in regular and various kinds of educational, cultural, social, and political, and other work, our mission is to foster a sense of collectivity and revive our community's long-standing belief in the possibility and necessity of creating a new and better world. Our fundamental premise has always been that collaboration and cooperation, rather than competition and division, are the key ingredients for making our desired social transformation. As individuals and organizations, we don't take credit for our center's abilities. Instead, we attribute the, its successes to the spirit and resilience of the people of Indianapolis. The dedication of our sponsors, I'm sorry, our supporters, partners, and the volunteers <clears throat> that work as members have allowed our community to meet, gather, work, and discuss. This is we are today. The Indianapolis Liberation Center is a space for all of us. It's our space. It's the people's space. A space of, for critical thinking and for challenging conversations. The only way a multifaceted, diverse collective of working class people like ourselves are able to uphold an event like this, free from large donors, and philanthropic capitalists and their terms and conditions is through individual community donations and maintaining financial independence. If you're inspired by what you see tonight, or if you've been inspired by what you've seen through our work and the community, and you want to support these efforts of uniting our community for social change, I invite you to scan one of the one-time donation QR codes around the room, visit, our purchase, visit and purchase from our merch table in the back. Um, also ask about the one time tonight raffle that we're doing, um, or speak with the Liberation Center uh, members around the room who can help you, uh, you know, find out how you can get involved if you're interested. You can also visit our ndliberationcenter.org website and click the Give Now um, link on our homepage to give if you wish. To those who have given in the past and those who, who contribute to contribute, um, we thank you and we, um, we're very thank thankful for your generous financial support. Without that, we wouldn't be here tonight. So we're here today to discuss art. It's emancipatory and unsettling potential. Art and the struggle for the liberation for Indianapolis to Palestine, to the Congo to Haiti, to Ireland and Korea. In the face of imperialist transgressions and violent oppression, artists and cultural workers around the globe are playing an important role in the struggle for liberation. They are doing so in part by spreading the message of solidarity with the people of Palestine, Yemen, the Central Sahel region, Cuba, and other subjected communities and oppressed nations. Art has always been a powerful tool for social and political change. From the earliest cave paintings to the contemporary street art, to the Wadley's Little Red Songbook, to the music of public enemy. From the murals of Belfast to the visual symbolism of South African protest theater, artists of all type have used their work to express their voices on society and the world around them. Understood in the broadest sense to include music and street theater, as well as all forms of visual representation, artistic expression has an undisputed place in contemporary social activism. 
More stylized and professional art forms and artists have been involved in political protests and movements throughout the modern era, and the linkages between aesthetics and politics, art and propaganda, have long been debated. Can political art be good art? Can good art be political? How effective is politicized art and the artists who made it? What exactly does art do in demonstrations of political protest? Marxist Leninist theory provides us a theoretical foundations and analytical framework for critical political reflection about class struggle. Internationalism and anti imperialism and revolutionary liberation. Practicing Marxism has demanded not only that art be set in relation to the social conditions that apply to it, but also to making it critical, also to making a critical revision of the history of art and revealing its conceptualized social role in each case of resistance and struggle. The Marxist conception of art itself is defined within the various historical contexts to which it arose. And yet, seized on and operationalized by the masses, art can become a tool for the oppressed and marginalized, signaling solidarity, expressing the struggle of work, the working class, challenging hegemonic ideologies, and influencing radical social change. Taken as a tool for social change, resistance is the condition of art. In our current struggle, the role of the activist artist is to create political art that evokes and stimulates a critical stance for the world, of the world. An example of this is the art of artists against apartheid. Another clear example is the art that surrounds us today in this room and will feature in Iskra Book's forthcoming publication, which we'll discuss soon. Art is effective in mobilizing an aesthetic consciousness for the masses. What such artistic representations, representations do is to jolt the viewer into questioning an all too familiar and largely unquestioned media saturated world, the status quo of imagery. In Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks writings, they teach us the status quo imagery in media and bourgeois art helps form and uphold the ruling class's cultural hegemony or the accepted and consented to dominant worldview of society. Gramsci argued that, world, that radical social change should come not only from revolutionary politics, but also through the rise of counter hegemonies and alternative cultures developed by disenfranchised groups. Through self-education, political organization, and the creation of new institutions of and for oppressed classes, a proletariat culture can become a tool in sharpening the contradictions and illuminating the exploitative nature of capitalist and imperialist societies. Art as a tool for social change, born from resistance, can be counter-hegemonic and emancipatory from the aesthetic, cultural, and political habits of the ruling class. From the Russian Revolution to the apartheid walls that try to separate Palestine from the rest of the world, protest art, art and protests, and the art of protest continue to play a vital role in transforming society and shifting perspectives. Art remains a powerful weapon of organizing and dissenting, provoking constructive dialogue, and creating space for debate beyond mainstream bodies of political discourse. The Liberation Center series Unleashing the Creativity of the Masses, exhibits and awakens an emancipatory potential and embodies the struggle of a counter-hegemony that combats, and, I, combats the ideals of the ruling class. In an ever-evolving struggle towards liberation and community, we must have art that reflects the wills and the desires of the working poor and the oppressed, rather than works that center on the whims of the privileged few. Creating an, inspire, creating an inspiring and meaningful artwork is a powerful tool to nourish not only just our own souls, but to empower our communities to imagine that a better world is possible. It affirms that art is not just a specific realm reserved for the only, only for the elite, but rather a practice in which all working and oppressed people engage in which we are all capable. Art and artistic practices are a product of our social conditions, our historical moment, but also has the potential to, to disrupt, to challenge dominant narratives, and to lay bare 
and sharpen the contradictions inherent to global capitalism. One of the most powerful aspects about art is that it is, a, it is for everyone, just as anti-imperialism is for everyone. Now please let me uh, introduce the three panelists we have this evening, who you will see on the screen behind me, or, I'm sorry, to my left. Um, we have first, uh, Talia Liu, sorry if I butchered these names, I really apologize. <laughs> Talia Liu holds a master's degree uh, in library and information science and a bachelor's degree in history, I'm sorry, in art history. Uh, she studies Jewish history with an emphasis in anti-Zionism, editorial cartoons and their impact on the working class, Irish Republican history, and international communism history more generally. She, sh she firmly believes in Brad Hampton's statement that theory that no practice, uh, ain't, uh, theory with no practice ain't shit. Yeah. Right. Roel Maximilian Mueller is a senior research fellow uh, at the Institute of Creativity and Innovation at Xiamen University in China. His research focuses on the contemporary African and Asian domestication of socialist realism in, in the plastic arts. And Ben Stunky is an artist, educator, and organizer working on the intersection of point media and political education. Ben is co-founding editor of Iskra Books, who provided the art tonight, uh, and the print journal Peace, Land, and Bread. And Ben holds a PhD and MS degree in environmental studies and an MA in political philosophy, and is currently pursuing a second degree, uh, second doctor degree, I should say, um, in organizational studies. Please everyone welcome our guests. Thank you all for being here. You, call, you can hear me well enough? Or? Yeah, thank Great. you. Hello. Yeah, awesome. Like yeah, sorry, sorry to put your names. <laughs> <laughs> so my first question is, um, I'd like to begin, I guess, um, this might be a question just for Ben. Uh, I don't know how well the other two are involved in, in the publications of ISCRA. Um, but maybe uh, just talk about the history, the background of Iskra Books, as well as the print journal Peace, Land, and Bread, and uh, particularly, particularly uh, as I was reading the history, um, maybe a bit about the approach to publishing and what it means to be a professional revolutionary publisher. Yeah, great question. So first of all, thank you so much for having us here. We're really excited and we're honored actually to have you all uh, hosting our art and hosting us. Uh, you know, we're comrades and we've published a couple of you comrades before uh, previously. Derek Ford, we have a couple of books out and I believe uh, Riley is connected with you all. So, you know, we support the work you do and we're just really grateful for you all having us. Um, yeah, to answer your question, so we started off like this is kind of a hotly debated topic inside the center because I think some of us think we started in 2016, some of us think 2017. But I think the work really began in earnest probably like late 2016. Um, we started off as an organization called the Center for Communist Studies. And the idea was that it was three of us initially. It's myself, a comrade named Amber Kelly, and then a comrade named Nate Reed, who is uh, sadly no longer with us, you know, at this group. Um, Still in the world, just no longer with us in the organization. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's still around. Um, uh, so we started off, and all three of us were graduate students, and we really, like, you know, I think the, like the three of us came together, um, you know, primarily through feeling sort of under supported in our academic programs. You know, I think all three of us were really interested in research from the Marxist Leninist lens on you know, revolutionary studies and politics. And you know, I remember my PhD program just giving, you know, giving lectures and you know, wanting to go, you know, uh, you know, do research in China, you know, at the international meeting of you know, like communist and working parties in Greece, and like, you know, showing all these things on like presentations and just getting like blank stares in the room and people just being like, like, what kind of research is this? You know, so I think. You know, we all had similar experiences, and those of us that kind of like work in these realms, I think, can kind of attest to this. Um, but yeah, we came together, you know, primarily, I think, just for like, you know, research support and camaraderie, and we saw the work that was happening with folks at, say, the Hampton Institute, who were able to run these really, you know, beautiful sort of decentralized, uh, you know, sort of academic research centers that existed, you know, on the cusp of, you know, the academy in the street. Like, it was like academics and working class people interested in scholarship coming together to really do the research that mattered and to do work that mattered to really impact, you know, liberation movements and working class movements and, you know, organizers. 
And so that was really the motivation you know, that brought us together. Um, the three of us came from a previous organization where we had engaged in some small scale publications, um, at a, you know, uh, hosted like an online you know, website with publications and like, you know, articles we hosted, published a couple of books, and you know, we had left that organization just you know, kind of feeling under supported by them and with some kind of organizational leadership issues. And so when we started, we really, you know, the idea was to engage in publishing and education. Uh, so as scholars ourselves, I think we were really just interested in carrying that work forward and supporting other scholars with this kind of work. And so, you know, the goal was to always publish. But I think in the beginning, you know, we come from an organization that had a pretty large, you know, online following. And when we started up as the Center for Communist Studies, we thought, okay, we're just going to keep rolling. We're going to start doing the same thing. We're going to, you know, people are going to follow us and follow our work. And I think initially we began publishing articles online, and it was, you know, like a fairly steady clip. But the articles just sort of fell flat, and they weren't really like, like you know, we're getting a couple likes here and there and a couple reads, and it really wasn't as I think impactful as we had imagined. So we spent a lot of time really building up the platform, you know, building up the organization, bringing on a lot of other editors and organizers, and scholars. Um, and I think it was really it was 2019 when we began to undertake the uh, you know print publishing a bit more seriously. In my PhD program, I had the opportunity to do an editorial assistantship in lieu of a teaching assistantship. So I did that and I had to have a deliverable, you know, from that uh, from that project. And the deliverable was Peace Land and Bread, you know. So I think we, you know, uh, cohered an editorial board, a bunch of early career researchers and organizers and scholars who were engaged in this kind of work, brought together an editorial board, you know, solicited submissions, you know, uh, put out a call for submissions and got the journal together. And that was really, that was our first time jumping into print publication. I think we published the first issue 2020, um, and it was just, it was like way more successful than I think any of us could have imagined. Um, and it was really, like it was exciting, and it was really, like, you know, it was just, like, really inspiring to, you know, to have it be met with, you know, such a great sort of response after years of publishing and not really having it take off. Um, and, you know, from that, I think the initial, to sort of touch on your question, you know, the sort of intersection of art and politics and publishing, I think from the get-go, you know, I, in addition to being up like a person who, you know, teaches in higher education and, you know, does this kind of stuff, I, you know, prior to grad school, I was a tattoo artist for 10 years, professional licensed tattoo artist in Olympia, Washington, and so I've always had this, you know, deep interest in art, and, you know, I hadn't really, prior to publication, I hadn't, like, my art and my organizing were always separate, you know, and I'm, like, do a lot of organizing with the, uh, the Communist Party, and, but, like, I had kept, for a long time, I had kept my art separate from my organizing and political work, but I think those two really, for some reason, it just came together. I think initially we had thought, okay, well, we can act as an editorial board, uh, we'll bring on some externals for, for typesetters and designers, and, you know, that didn't really come through, and so it was like, well, we have a couple artists on staff here, let's just see what we can make happen. Um, and like the result was, you know, what we ended up doing with Peace Land and Bread was, uh, you know, it's this intersection of poetry and arts. Um, and I think from that, and from the really, really positive response we had, it was just we were really sort of motivated to, you know, to adopt that spirit of communist art more generally, which is always, I think, at the front and at the avant-garde of arts movements. And we were just really inspired to continue to push that and to, you know, mess around with experimentation as far as the arts go and this mixture of like arts and publishing. And we saw really sort of like fantastic results, you know, I mean, there's that like uh, the adage of, you know, not judging a book by its cover, but I think we all engage in that, right? And I think in the efforts of uh, accessibility, like as a publisher, we don't, you know, we don't put things behind paywalls, everything is immediately free online. You know, the, the publications that we do serve the movement, we don't want these things to be inaccessible to the people who need them most, right? So everything is free. Um, publications are priced as, as close to cost as possible. We can, like, I, I think the highest author royalties in the industry now. Um, and we give a lot of money back to the comrades who are doing the work. So I think as part of that, you know, sort of search for accessibility, we really, we just, you know, we saw it reflected in the feedback that we got. And we, you know, started to see and understand, too, that art really, you know, carries publications. And so I think where we're at now, it is really this beautiful intersection. We have, like, the comrades that are here with me today, uh, Talia is on our steering committee. She's one of the core editors that really drives ISRA. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Rule, we just brought on, I'd say a couple of months ago, but really fantastic, working on a really brilliant book called Building a People's Art that we have coming out, I believe, September until the August? Um, yes, September 14th, hopefully, and it's focused on Vietnamese socialist realism from people. It's a theory-based book. Well, I'll let Rule 
talk about it. I shouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just proved it yesterday. I finished proving it, and it's absolutely fantastic. But I'll let him talk about it. <laughs> yeah, please, Rule, if you'd if you yeah. like to. Um, yeah, well, just just, just in, in regard to to what, what Ben said with um, with, with ISPRO and, and the, the intersection with, with R, it was actually one of the things, and me being the, the new guy, and, and obviously apologies to everyone for my accent. I'm, I'm South African, so I know that I'm trying, I'm trying my best, but, but I was like, you sound great, you sound great here. To something I read, just, just bear with me. But yeah, I, I'm the, the, the youngest member of the group. And the, the thing that, that attracted me to this project initially was the, the emphasis on the intersection with art that, that the publisher holds. And, and that, that's why originally the, the, the book that I had, that we, we can talk about a little bit more as we go through, I think it will be a nice point to come back to the whole time. But initially, I started putting the, the book together, the book about Vietnamese socialist business, uh, for my students here in Vietnam. And because lots of the material it is not available here, and definitely not available for you guys. Um, so it was very much a, a project to conserve and, and build some of these materials. And there was, there was actually two, I, I won't give their names, two m more academic publishers interested that wanted to carry. But if I immediately realized that, that it was just going to be completely impractical with the, the inaffordability of this book. And, and the whole purpose of this book was primarily for my Vietnamese students. And, and so it, it forced me to start looking elsewhere. And that's where I came across ISPRA and I was just instantly connected with their focus on art and the fact that they allowed for, for these books to be released for free as well. That's great. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to follow up just on that question about um, the art uh, that is presented in, in both the, the, the journal, I guess, and then that, that we have here tonight. Um, have you shown ISCA art before and other galleries, and, and what it, how is the reception of that? And, and then I guess as a follow up to that, and I think we'll get back to this question because I think I have another one if we get there. But um, but maybe you know your thoughts on um, the power of art. I guess you know uh, the power of art in, in that space of the political, because I do think it, it invites a space for conversation that other ways wouldn't occur. And I think I've noticed that within our liberation center is that. Um, People, people come here for the art night and, and we can have conversation that um, that art invites, uh, or art allows to happen, right? Um, and it's, and it's, it's not depoliticized by any means, but it is, um, it's a safe space, if you will, quote unquote. So have you, has that art been shown elsewhere, other galleries, or, um, you know, do, I guess what's the, what's the power of presenting this in the, in the and the um, and the publication, the journal publication, uh, in order to spark conversation about um, anti-imperialism or, or what it may have Yeah, been. definitely. Yeah, we've had a couple uh, so far. I think, um, and if I'm mistaken, comrades, correct me. But I think we've done a couple of gallery showings. Primarily, nothing like what we're doing tonight, right? So this is really cool to have, like you know, to have all of our art there. It's really awesome. This is a first for us, um, but. Uh, Prior to this, we've had a couple of pieces, uh, you know, Artists Against Apartheid, we had a couple of pieces uh, shown in that demonstration at the People's Forum, uh, you know, which was primarily geared towards Palestinian liberation. And then we've had a couple of pieces shown at um, a good friend of ours, Ian Machet, who runs the Swords into Plowshares uh, Gallery in Detroit, has hosted us a couple times um, as part of different shows. I think a couple shows, Capitalism or Eco-socialism or socialism or barbarism was one of the shows, and there was another one that we were in. Um, yeah, we've done it a couple times, and it's really, really impactful. I think it's really impactful too. And I think, like you said, you know, there's such a it draws people in, right? And I think when we first started doing this, as far I mean, just in the publications, there was um, 
it, it, like it wasn't, I mean, like a little bit in, you know, it rags like uh, Jacobin, there's a little bit of sort of crossover with like art and scholarship, you know, but it like wasn't really, not to the degree that I think we wanted to take it. Um, so much so that when we started, you know, we really tried to push the envelope a little bit with the art stuff and some of the early issues of Peace, Land, and Bread. Like, which I look back on right now, I can cringe a little bit, like, oh, we're going a little too far. Um, but I don't, you know, like, whatever, it's in that spirit of, like, you know, pushing the movement and sort of just experimenting, right, and seeing what sort of, like, you know, resonates with people. But we actually have gotten a letter from a comrade uh, from, who is it, the Communist Party of uh, Edinburgh or something, Scotland, Edinburgh, and they wrote us and they were like, what are you doing? Like, you can't, like, you, like I think it was issue two of Peace Land Bread, which is arguably a little yeah. bit more, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they wrote us and they were like, you can't do this. This is not what a communist publication looks like. You know, it's at, like, uh, you need to make your publication more like our publication. And he sends over this example. And the example, it looks like a, I mean, no offense, you know, it's a high school, but it was like a high school newsletter. Like, like it looked like the kind of stuff you worked on as part of, like, uh, oh, you know, the yearbook team or something. It, it was very, very, like, low grade. It was just, it's like, like the same clip art that we've all seen, that we all like, I'm sure, like Marx and Engels and Lenin. It, it's just the same clip art that people have rendered into vectors that float around online. And when you type in like Marx, Engels, Lenin clip art, you know, it shows up. Um, and it was it was full of that stuff, and it was just really, really tasteless. And the, you know, the guy really kind of laid into us. And it was like, I, I, you know, I think in that regard, we really, it's like we're not trying to do art that that like looks like communist art. Like we're communists, you know, and we organize and we're in it parties. It is communist art because it's a communist we are communists. And he called yeah. it a comic book. He called it the Peace Land Bread comic book. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, comic book artists are amazing as well. Like yes, whatever. That whole exchange really upset me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like there's a real and. Rule, please, if you have anything else to add, please do. But I, I just want to say, I feel like there's this, uh, locally in Indianapolis, there's a weird disconnect from the zine culture and like the art that we were trying to do within this new gallery that we've opened. And so, but the zine culture has a lot of important things to say. And like, how do we bridge that gap? Um, I don't know if that's related to, to what you're talking about, but um, I think it might be. I mean, zines are so important to the movement, like, especially in the early 90s, they, like, exploded. Um, it was a great way, is the DIY culture, it was a great way for people to get across very quickly. Um, I don't know if you know about Riot Girl, but it was a feminist punk movement in the early 90s, and it really exploded because of zines. And, they still are very important because they're so accessible and there's art and there's text. Um, I don't think I'd be partly here if it wasn't for zines. There's a zine library in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Like, they are incredibly important to our movement, even though like I think anarchists really have the corner on the zine market, but like mm -hmm. I, I do believe they're still very, very important. And I believe like Peace Land Bread can bridge that gap because we're also like peer reviewed and everything like that. So yeah. Are you in Minneapolis? I'm from Minneapolis, okay. but I'm living in Dublin now. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. I'll check your books all day. Love that place. <laughs> um, yeah, I used to live in Minneapolis. So, um, so I, I wanted to say, so then the opposite side of that is like, how do we not let art be too uh, mainstream and, and then the conversation around art be too academic, right? Because I feel like what you guys do is, is very accessible. Um, and how do you navigate accessibility, I guess, to a broader audience than being just your, just another academic journal? Yeah, great question. I'll let one of you cover it. feel that if you don't, I feel like I've talked a lot so far. <laughs> um, I think coming from, from my side as the, the new member, I think in terms of the accessibility, the, the one thing that I really like with ISRA is, like, like we mentioned before, the, the art and the creative aspect, which makes some of the more um, theoretical stuff a lot more palatable. You don't, no matter how, how bookwormy or nerdy you are, it gets a bit tedious going through theory day after day after day. That there needs to be some level of palatableness. And I think 
that the inclusion of art and, and creative aspects like poetry and, and all this, it, it helps make it a lot more manageable. Um, I think on, on that, that point as well, if I can just add a little bit more, I, I think that, that what it does as well is there is, when looking at, at America and, and the West and the communist movements, there, there is a lot of focus on practice, which, which is good, naturally, but not much focus on theory. And what, what obviously I'm speaking from the outside now, uh, but what, what we see happening is we see a lot of, a lot of energy and a, and a lot of vibrance, especially the, the young vibrancy, which is good, but with very little direction. It, it, and just constant factionalizing, splitting, and, and, and no clear line or trajectory. And I think that obviously practice is important, but practice is important once you've got the theoretical down. And I don't think that the West has the theory down yet, America in particular. I don't think America has the theory down. And I, so I, I think that the practice element is a little bit, you know, putting the, the, the what, the cart before the horse or whatever that, <laughs> that yeah. Indian was, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I think there needs to be a double down on theory, and which, which obviously means encouraging theory, encouraging reading, encouraging all this. And, and that's where this palatableness makes it quite, quite good, quite positive. Well, that's a really good point. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I think that's a really good point. I actually wanted to. I'm sorry. I'll let you go ahead, Talia. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna go off of that uh, because uh, I found a book from the uh, early '30s, I believe, that was produced by a artist named Hubert Huger Gallert, who was like a committed communist for his whole life, and it's called Capital and Lithographs. And his whole idea was to make capital palatable. So he had lithographs for each section of capital. So you have the visual literacy and then you have the theory. So people could understand this is what Marx is talking about. And it, they're just like excerpts from capital, like for a minute. And I think I, we're going to be republishing it hopefully by the end of the year, um, if everything goes well. Uh, but yeah, I, I totally agree with you that like you have to make it palatable, and that's why putting things, including art with the theory, is really important because you'll not only see what this theoretical concept is, you'll understand it a lot better. Yeah, I think also, too, just to sort of wrap up really quickly, there's to, to keep art from being just, I mean, art for art's sake, I think is one thing, and it's beautiful, and like art is fantastic, and I think as artists, we like we engage in that, and there's like therapeutic dimensions, but I think we're really specifically interested, right, in the politicization of art, and using art for the, polit like, like for political purposes, right, and there's this beautiful quote, I just pulled it up, and it's always on my mind, right, Walter Benjamin, uh, so mankind's self-alienation has reached such a degree that it can experience its own destruction as an aesthetic pleasure of the first order, this is the situation of politics, which fascism is rendering aesthetic. Communism responds by politicizing art. So that's all fascism has, right? Fascism, all it has is the sort of like, uh, like, like it's got raw emotion, it doesn't have theory. It's got raw emotion, it has the aesthetics and the red caps, you know, and the American flags, and like it has all of the sort of hallmarks of, you know, fascist aestheticization, but to sort of flip that on its head, right? Communism has to politicize art. Like we have to make art as political. And even if we're doing art for art's sake, that art has to by nature be politicized and we have to use that as part of the movement, right? So I've always found that quote to be really beautiful. Sorry for just jumping in. I know you wanted to say something, um, Zachary, but um, yeah. No, that's great, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think you covered actually what I was gonna ask about and that was just about like, how can we further in tandem by exposing people to radical art um, in tandem, you know, exercise political education within our space, within all of these radical community spaces, people's forum being one. Um, do you know how, how those conversations happen in tandem? I think it's something that we are, 
in early days of navigating within our center. So if any of the three of you have any ideas about that, um, how we can do arts gallery nights in addition to, and granted, I mean, this conversation is fantastic with you reading here, but you know, how we can, yeah, how we can deepen the conversation, I guess. I can talk a little bit about what I've done. Um, I, since I am in Ireland, um, whenever I have friends or comrades come visit, I will always take them to Belfast to see the murals. And that opens up a wide conversation about the political history of Ireland and how the six counties are still under occupation. Um, those murals are so critical for political education because everyone can see them because they're so big, they're so powerful, they change continuously. So you're never gonna see the same murals. On Sunday, they're um, unveiling a whole, a whole wall of Palestinian solidarity murals. So I think having a space like yours and maybe having like just a t talk about the political history of like say, I don't know, it's, since it's women's, I think it's Women's History Month right now in March. It is, yes, um, you're right. Yeah, it, it's different everywhere, but yeah, maybe show, showcasing women artists talking about radical women history. I know it's also Irish American uh, month in America as well, and maybe discussing, showing the murals, talking about the murals, explaining about Irish history through the murals. That's what's makes art so important and so powerful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask one more, I guess one more quick question maybe, and then I'll open up to our audience members if anyone would like to um, ask three of you questions. But um, I was maybe just a quick word, and maybe this is for Ben or, or, or the other two of you, but um, a quick word on the forthcoming book what that looks like, what it, how the art that we have here today plays a role in that in that forthcoming publication. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so great question. So uh, that uh, so the book is the art of peace, land, and bread, and it was just kind of it, it wasn't something that I think we had like initially intended to do. I think initially, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, the work was primarily focused on you know text-based stuff and scholarship and like deep theory and history and ecology and stuff of that nature. But we a lot of people asking us like, can you can you all please put together all the art that you've done? Because we do a lot of like radical poster art, you know, everything that we do, we try to like hype up with art. Um, and so it was kind of, you know, we had our arms twisted a little bit to get this publication together. And it started off, it was it was going to be released two years ago in 2022. And I had just moved, I think I I'd moved that summer. Um, and so a lot of my stuff was in boxes, you know, but I had created a hundred pieces of art that year. And it's like, we're just cranking it out, you know, at a pretty steady clip there. So I think, you know, um, at the end of the year, and that, like after folks asking us, it was like we have a fair amount of art that we can really compile into a book. We have all these really, you know, wonderful contributions by people that have, you know, given their art for book covers, you know, um, a lot of which is my own art. And so, you know, we began to compile it. And then I think, you know, what happened is we just began to get like more contributions, you know, the art continued to grow and then the project didn't come out in 2022. And it was like, okay, well, let's make this a 22, you know, 23 sort of, you know, dual year annual kind of a thing. And then it didn't come out in 23, and it's just so much more, I think, than that, uh, you know, that can go into this book. And so I think, you know, where the book is at now, it's gonna be, uh, you know, it's gonna cover the span of, you know, like two and a half, three years. It's slated hopefully to come out this summer or at the end of spring. Uh, you know, Derek Ford is writing a really fantastic uh, forward to the book. Uh, Sarah Pohl is writing an afterword to the book. And it should be really fantastic. And we're gonna, you know, what folks can expect from the book is a really, you know, beautiful, high quality. Uh, we're actually just uh, the way that we publish and print and distribute. We have the ability now um, to publish in this like, uh, what is it, like ultra premium, you know, high gloss color. So we can do, you know, really, really beautiful art books. I think in the past we were a little bit limited by our printing, but now that we have access to better sort of printing tech, um, the first book I think that we're releasing that you know has you know, ultra premium uh, color is gonna be Musa Springer's poetry and photography book that's coming out very soon. I think March 15th is the release date for that. And they're just beautiful. I mean, just like it's such a beautiful uh, publication. And I think that that level of printing is gonna really, you know, do all the full color art justice. So the book should be a couple hundred pages. I've done, I think for all of our art books going forward, we're aiming for like a seven inch by 10 inch, you know, so sizable, kind of like an academic style art book. Um, but it should be, 
full color. It should have some really deep, you know, good theory in there. Um, and primarily, it's just going to showcase the art. It's going to showcase all of our book cover art. It's going to be a, a, a lot of my stuff and a lot of other comrades' art. Um, a lot of other folks who've contributed to the project over the years. So it should be really fantastic. And I'm, yeah, I'm excited for everyone to check it out. Um, it's a little wild having all of my art into one book. Um, the thing I don't like to do, you know, is to use Iskra to really like you know, like get my own publications out there, you know, I'd much rather publish other people's work. So it's a little bit like the cameras turned back on me a little bit, which is a little weird and kind of uncomfortable, but I think, you know, regardless, it should be a really brilliant publication uh, and it'll be a really, you know, beautiful kind of table book. Um, yeah, so we're looking forward to it. Yeah, it looks, it looks great. I'm excited about it. And I know everyone here is excited about it. Um, uh, how can people reach you and then I'll turn it over to the audience. But how can people reach you, Iskra Books, um, to sub for submissions? Just the website is that the best way for poetry and um, and art to, to to do to submit. Yeah, so we've got uh, we uh, run a pretty robust social media. Um, we you know we're on Facebook, but Facebook is a dying platform, uh, right? So you know, we have a, a, a fairly large following on Facebook. Uh, you know we're on Twitter at uh, PLB Magazine, uh, and then also is for Books at is for Books. Um, the majority of our social media is centered around Peaceland Bread, so uh, you know it's at PLB Magazine on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for X, and then is for Books. Uh, we have an account for Iskra Books only on Twitter or X, well, which is just at Iskra Books. Our website uh, for Iskra is uh, iskrabooks.org, I-S-K-R-A books.org. And that's the website that we update most frequently. Uh, we also have PLB, um, or it's uh, Peace Land Bread, so uh, no and, just peacelandbread.org. And that was our primary website for a while. I think at the end of the year, we're going to roll the Peace Land and Bread website into Iskra, which has become sort of the larger you know, uh, umbrella under which you know most of our work kind of assumes now. Um, but yeah, primarily is for books. You can reach me at ben at iskerbooks.org or talia at iskerbooks.org. Uh, inquiries at iskerbooks.org. If you'd like to submit anything, we're always taking submissions. We really, we're more focused now, I think, on like manuscript publications. So if folks have book ideas, if mm -hmm. folks want to submit art, poetry, we take all that and we're you know, we're here to publish comrades. We're here for the movement, and we're here, you know, we're here to serve the movement and to really, um, to get good works out there to really, uh, yeah, keep things moving forward, so. Awesome, yeah, very excited about Leon Vincent's book, by the way, I saw that post tomorrow. Yes, next week. Yeah, right. Awesome. Right, um, does anyone uh, in the audience would they like to ask some questions? Yeah. Um, well, before I ask my question, I also wanted to say it's really cool how, what a small world we live in, where like, it, it, things keep connecting, like between groups on the left, like, uh, you know, publishing companies, parties, other, all kinds of organizations, like, just like getting closer and closer. Uh, like, I definitely, Talia, I definitely recognize your voice from like various podcasts that I've listened to. Yeah. Um, it's really cool that you were publishing something from, from Musa Springer. He was just here for a panel. Uh, like a week ago, we I met him in person, um, and then obviously like Derek, uh, you know, publishing through Iskra Books and stuff. So it's just really cool how many connections there are and how you know, what a small world it is. I think it's a good sign that all of these different forces on the left are talking and connecting and working together. So that's that's really cool. Uh, one of my questions was, we have been working on, <clears throat> we've had a few like book clubs and study groups in the past where we like read a book and study it, and I'm sure that like a book from Iskra is in our future that we will, you know, study some materials from Iskra. I'm wondering if you all have, like, accompanying materials for any of your books. Like, we're always, you know, you can always come up with your own discussion questions and, and, uh, and you know, supplementary stuff, but I'm wondering if, if you know, if I, if on their, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at Iskra's website or anything, if there are, like, supporting materials for people who want to do studies of certain texts, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, hopefully my question makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Well, we don't currently have that, but that's a really amazing idea. Um, I, you know, I think the only limiting factor we have right now is we're an all volunteer organization, so this is just kind of a you know kind of a get in where you fit in, and all of us have you know families and jobs and all these things. But we, uh, you know, despite that, you know, still are able to devote full time work to Iskra just because it's such a passion project. But I think you know ultimately we're just you know more or less limited by our time, so we haven't done that. Uh, 
historically, but that's an amazing idea. Like, it would be amazing to release sort of like readers to go along with each text that had like, you know, yeah, I mean, we could absolutely do that. And that's something that we should really talk about, comrades, like, maybe after this call, we can maybe sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> sort of like yeah, well, maybe, that's, that's a really good idea. If a book, if a study org like reads one of our books, maybe they can send us the questions that they have and then we could put it up as like little reader's guide. So if you want to take this on, you are more than welcome to. That's a really good idea. Yeah, why don't we do something like that? So if there's something that you comrades want to see, please, please reach out to us, because we could absolutely, I mean, so I think we got Leon and Benson's book together. It was the fastest turnaround we've ever, we're trying to make the March 8th deadline. And I think they showed up today. I'm not sure if they showed up today or tomorrow or the latest, but um, we're able to get that out really quick. But if there's anything that you comrades ever want to see, yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out, because that's something that if you had some, like, if you wanted to put together, like, a reading group on something, we could absolutely put together a publication that's, like, I mean, as long as other comrades and organizations are going to benefit from this, it's like, why not? You know, we're an educational organization, and this is the kind of stuff we do and that we're passionate about. So, yeah, I think you just gave us a really amazing idea. Please do be in touch. We'd love to, you know, <laughs> yeah, follow up sure. on that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, do you do you uh, use uh, Iskra books in your with your students, and then like, how do you engage in conversation with them about you know politics of art? Um, I'll say the first part of the question. Oh, is that it's, uh, I was just asking Rule about um, you know how he in, he uses this for books within the classroom with his students, or if it does, and then um, in Vietnam, and then you know how how that how that sparks the conversation between politics and art, and the purpose of art and politics. Um, it, it, it's a good question. The, it, it might be a bit of an interesting answer, but in in Vietnam, for example. With, with my students, we never really engage in the political aspect. And I know that sounds weird, but it's basically because it's already given. Mm. And, and, I, and the, the, this is what I was kind of trying to get at with, with my, my answer earlier, mm. where there's a slight difference that you see between what we can call, I don't know, the West, the East, is there any better terminology? actually existing socialism or whatever it's called versus not actually existing socialism. <laughs> but, but between the two worlds, between the, the capitalist world and the slightly less capitalist world. Um, so, so politics it is not really ever a, a taught thing because it's very much already given in, in that sense. So that when, when we approach texts and stuff, like I, I know um, the, the one text that, that the students have been, were reading, uh, God, I forgot his name now, the guy with the, the BBC documentaries. Um, oh, shit, what's his name? What? The, all, all about how to see, how to see. And yeah, that's, uh, uh, yeah, the oh. ways of seeing, right? Oh. Yeah. yeah, John Berger, John Berger, right? John Berger, thank you, thank you, yes, yes. Yeah, there we go. So, so, so he's, he's one of our, our curriculum reading materials, and, and obviously he's, he's communist, but, but we never really engage in that aspect because it's just there. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's a bit of a weird answer, but I hope it makes sense. I think it does, I think it's, it's an interesting um, other side of the coin, if you will, because here is, is there is a need to have the conversation about theory, in addition to um, art making room for that discussion. Um, and so it's interesting that that is just a, a given um, natural state of, I guess, education. I, I think, I think if I could just just carry on on that point, is that there is an element in that that is actually puts you guys in a much better position than we are for for all of you guys your your um introduction to to communism or socialism or whatever has very much been a self-discovery because your system is set up in, in a way where it's hidden or it's bastardized or it's completely made evil that you you basically discover it on your own you have almost like an enlightening Epiphany moment, you know, where you realize, 
when you're reading Marx or Lenin or whatever, you realize, oh shit, this, this is why the world is the way it is. And, and it, it, it's very much like a self-discovery. So Americans in particular, entering communism, have a much stronger passion and, and a positivity towards it because it, it's something that they've discovered in a way like a scientist discovers something. There, there, there's a positive aspect attached. Whereas on the other side, not that it's negative, it's just that it's very much already a given. You know, it, it, it's like the law of gravity. You know, who, who's passionate about the law of gravity? <laughs> you know, it is. <laughs> I'm not going to make a post about the law of gravity. It's just like, like considered a, a factual norm. Yeah. So, so I mean that, that, yeah. that that's the difference where, where you guys have a, a strong positivity towards it, whereas on our side it's very much just a given. You know, even though we agree, we all agree that that yes, this this is the the way forward, or at least mostly the way forward. There, 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 we don't hold as much personal attachment to it as, as Americans in particular. That's really interesting. And how is it uh, in Ireland? Because I have seen, and I assume a lot of the comrades in the audience have seen as well, Ireland is kind of leading the way in regards of international diplomacy um, and solidarity with Palestine. Um, what is the, I guess, how is the political education in Ireland um, in terms of anti-imperialism and communism? Well, I think why there's so much solidarity with Palestine is because of the 800-year rule of Britain over Ireland and the fact that it's still under occupation. The ties with Palestine and Ireland are very, very strong and have been strong for a very long time. Um, I know there, when there were hunger strikes in 81 in Ireland up the north, there were also solidarity hunger strikes in Palestine. It's a back and forth. Um, and what's ironic is during the so-called troubles is that the Communist Party did not take part in that. It was an on-the-ground movement uh, with the provisional IRA uh, leading the way, and there, it, they were all fighting for a, social, a socialist republic. Um, but yeah, there, the left is very fractured here. Uh, but I, like, we are very in support of Palestine, and I think that's just the nature of Ireland in general. Like Ro was saying. It's just a given. It's just a given that Irish people would support Palestine because they had to fight for their independence from the Brits, and the Brits caused the issues in Palestine. They're the ones who started it because when Lord Balfour signed the Balfour Declaration, he said, I want to start a little Ulster in Palestine. Um, and the Black and Tans ran from Ireland to Palestine to enforce it. So, yeah, it's just a given. <laughs> like here, just to support Palestine. Yeah, thanks for putting that in the context. I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about the art itself. Um, I noticed with a lot of revolutionary um, art and art that challenges imperialism and capitalism, there are kind of some like reoccurring themes, like almost like the halo effect around revolutionaries, or even like the color schemes and how they're, they're like muted at sometimes in like less bright in collections. Could you talk a little bit about the purpose behind that, or, or does it just happen organically? Yeah, definitely. So somebody had actually asked that. I think it was on, uh, you know, we had shared something on Instagram and somebody asked, like, why is, you know, why is all your art, oh, uh, what would they say, why is all your art dirty and, and run down looking? And I said, it's because we ourselves are dirty and run down. <laughs> <laughs> and it just comes out that way. But I think, you know, more so, I think, you know, I'm an atheist. Um, I don't really want to be, I, I just can't help it, you know, but I think that, you know, for lack of having any sort of like, you know, uh, religious cosmology or anything, you know, we make saints of revolutionary leaders, you know, and like we have to like look to people, you know, for our own sort of like humanistic religion or something, or I do anyways, you know, and so I think when I do a lot of these like halos around revolutionary leaders, it, it's just for me because I don't have anything else in my life that I sort of like look to. I know other comrades are a lot different and you know, religion should and does, you know, sort of permeate the movement. But I just, you know, for me personally, I think that that's what I'm doing there. And 
I've only ever had the opportunity to think about it because I think people inside of ISCR are like, what's up with the halos, Ben? And it's like, that's a good question. So I think in like reflecting on that, I think that's kind of what I'm doing here. Um, as far, yeah, as far as other, no, no, go ahead, Luke. Oh, I just thought it was like an emphasis on like the faith 